Can you guys hear me now? Is the audio okay now? Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Just double checking on that. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I haven't streamed in a month, and it defaulted to a different microphone, so... Uh, my apologies. <laughs> I was rambling on there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, people. Thanks for hanging in there. And um, hi, Dan. Thanks, thanks again, Cassie. And then A to the J. And there's a Dr. Kumlich. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, and again, um, thank you all for joining me today. And, and um, I should be back to doing this every week. So... Um, hopefully we are, you know, um, going to be, be here and in general and always, if you guys have, um, ideas for, for things you're curious about or whatever, um, in the, in the last couple months, I'd been talking a lot about, um, like we went through and kind of designed a game together, um, previously and we did a bunch of world building and things like that. And I'm going to kind of go back for a while to, to sort of talking about a lot of topics and talking about a lot of things. So, so please guys, um, email me, DM me, tell me on this channel, whatever. If you've got something that's, that you're itching to know, to know about, I'm happy to talk about it in weeks to come, um, and stuff. So please, anytime you have something that you'd like me to talk more about, please give me ideas and suggestions because I'm here for you. This is, this is for you guys, you know, and, um, so I do, you know, I do appreciate it when I know what people are interested in learning about. All right. So let me go back through my ramble just really quickly this time though. Um, Today's about what a game designer really truly does. Like, what is that job? What do I really do as a game designer? What 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 is that thing that that, that I I really do kind of day to day? And what is the reality of the job? And I, and I want to gut check everybody a little bit. So whether you are thinking about becoming a game designer, which you know I find this is the most common question there. Whether you're in school studying to be a game designer. Um, or, you know, even if you're kind of a junior game designer and you're not quite sure, it's amazing how much misconception there is in the world of game design about, you know, what we really do. And I would even argue sometimes when I've been with executives or in meetings, you know, and I've been doing this for 20 years and people will still be like, what does a game designer really do? Like there's artists and there's engineers and there's all these other things and, and what's a game designer's job actually? And it's amazing how, how many people even in our industry don't really truly get like what we do every day. Right. And, and so I want to make sure that, that you guys, you know, have a reference and I'm going to do my best to talk about this today. Um, kind of from a conceptual level. And I, I think we may spend a few more weeks on this as well. I want to have um, Scott Bayless, who also works with me at CG Spectrum, um, to come on. And we're going to do a talk um, together about um, how to use Unreal and and really like show you like how you really use it. It's not about like learning Unreal. There's a million places and a million YouTube channels about learning Unreal. But like as a game designer, what do you actually do? Like what what's that job do? Like, you know, the common question I get every day is like, how technical do I need to be? Like how... Do I need to be a programmer? Do I need to be a game designer? Do I get an artist? Like, yeah. Like, you got to kind of be this jack of all trades kind of person and, and stuff. And it, and it is hard to really understand who and what you are as a game designer. So, so everybody, please again, welcome. Um, and welcome. Um, and, and thank you for joining me again today. And I apologize for being gone. Um, this last month, my father passed away and it's, it's been a, it's been a really rough, really rough year for me. So, um, but hopefully now I'm back and we're going to be, you know, doing this every week again and, and really trying to, to solve everybody's um, problems and answer all your questions about the life, you know, and, and tribulations of being a game designer and, and the, the most, you know, amazing, fulfilling, satisfying job you can ever have and hard as hell. You know, and so I'm not going to sugarcoat that one. It, this is, this is the, you know, I, probably the hardest job I know of. It, it's way harder than people think. It's way harder than people give us, you know, credit for and stuff. And so, um, so let's, let's dive in. And again, please ask questions. This, this is a conversation today. This is not, you know, just me up here jabbering. And so if anything's confusing, if I'm moving too fast, or if you want me to, to really, you know, dive in, I'm going to try and give some explanation or some examples of like, you know, problems I've had at studios or problems I've had on projects or companies and, you know, those things as well. And so, um, so 
what do we really do as a game designer, right? It, it, it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, because, and the, I think the other thing that, that, that makes it challenging is that that answer, I don't know if it's ever been exactly the same on any project, at any company, um, anywhere. It, it's always different. It's always changing. It, it's, there, there's no one process. There's no one set of tools. There's no one engine. There's no one general way that our industry really designs games. Um, you know, for people like myself, we, you know, I, I taught myself how to be a game designer. There wasn't game design schools 30 years ago. There wasn't even a book on game design when I started. There wasn't a, a video on it. There was, there was zero information. There was no schools. There was nothing. I mean, the, you know, the, even the job of game designer as a job title for my note didn't even really exist, um, back in like 1990 or so when I started, um, Gosh, the dinosaurs, I think, were roaming back then, too. So I can't remember if that was when I got chased by the T-Rex. But, you know, but when we were starting, you know, we had to learn ourselves. And so this industry has really evolved a lot. It's really come a long ways. But because it started, I think, with just everybody figuring it out, right? And it wasn't like there was a lot of set processes like you would have seen in the movie industry or TV industries or things that were a little more mature, Um we, we kind of evolved and devolved into, into a million different ways. And so I want you to understand that today's conversation, um, no matter what you take home from this, is understanding that there there is no right way. There's no set way. There's no specific way. There's lots of ways. And, and so really, this is about getting you concepts. And in the end, um, even when I teach my course, it's about teaching you how to think. It's about teaching you how to understand how to make a decision, how to make that decision to be the best you can. Because, you know, in the end, um, you know, if you can't think and you can't know how to apply what you've learned into new situations, that's where you're going to die. Right. And, and, and so the job of game designer, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this a lot is really, you, you have to be a never ending, um, um, learner. You know, and, and there's literally hardly a day that goes by, even, even after 30 years of this, that I don't have to do something, that I don't learn something related to game design. Now, whether that is game design itself, or whether that's related to the, the project I'm working on, or something like that, but you, you can't just get in, learn what you need to learn in a year, or two, or three, and then just like, okay, I got all the knowledge, like, I can go have a career for the next 30 years, like, it doesn't work that way. You know, this is this is something that um, you have to really want. It's something you have to want to make a career um, because you got to be passionate about it because it just consumes your life. And, and in a good way. Like, I mean, I, I love what I do. I love getting up in the morning and being a game designer. Um, I don't sometimes like going to bed at 4 a.m. when I'm, you know, trying to get a project done and knowing I got to get up at 6 a.m. Um, I still love getting up, but <laughs> it's, it is a hard job. So real quick, um, Daniel, um, yeah, thanks for the katana. I, as, as you guys have probably seen, you know, from behind me, you know, my wall of shame of the games I've worked on and a lot of board games and stuff that I play for reference and I still, um, still to this day, I play tons and tons of games for reference and, and, and board games that are purest are some of the best reference, um, for video game design. And, um, like even over the weekend with my boys, I played, um, Star Wars, the Outer Rim. And, um, if you guys haven't played that and you're into board games, check it out. I was really like really, really impressed with Star Wars Outer Rim. Like I didn't, it kind of came out of nowhere and somebody was like, oh yeah, I should try it and see. And it, it blew me away. It was so good. So um, I really like the mechanics in it. So um, board games can definitely be a huge inspiration um, for game designers. So Daniel, let's see. Um, you're having a hell of a time finding the info on how to break into the industry as a designer as opposed to artist or dev. How do I make myself more hireable? I'm playing around in Unity now. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I probably should do a whole live stream kind of on this. And I honestly don't know um, how much I can tell you. Um, you know, the, in the end, our industry really is about um, what you can do, right? It's, it's not as much about what degree you have on paper. It's more akin to like an artist, right? Where... You know, if you can do a really great drawing, 
somebody's going to hire you, they don't necessarily look and go like, hey, did you go to Academy of Arts University or did you go to this or did you go to that, right? They, they look at your pure skill. And so game design, whereas I would argue that a lot of like programmers, for example, might be a little bit more picky about like, did you get a degree somewhere? Um, and in game design, it's a little bit more um, like, do, do you know what you're talking about, right? And that's a little harder to quantify. Um, and so the, the best advice for any designer who wants to get into or any person that wants to get in and get a job as a game designer is you've got to be able to, one, have the best portfolio ever. And you really need to know, you know, how to design games. And so a portfolio, um, and, and I do have a previous, uh, for those of you who haven't seen a previous live stream on how to make your portfolios and some stuff. I did a, a talk um, some months ago with Maxine, who's a, who's part of our um, kind of like helps people, help students get jobs and things like that. So I do have a previous talk on kind of like how to build a little bit better portfolio and stuff. Um but ultimately, it really is about your portfolio. If you have no experience and no nothing, your portfolio is the best thing. And that should be, you know, anything from paper designs, meaning like uh, game design documents, pitch decks, you know, things like that, all the way into, you know, it might also be, um, you know, playable games, you know, or, you know, any kind of stuff that you're capable of creating to, to really make a great portfolio piece. And so, um, yeah, whether you're using Unity or Unreal or modding another game engine or whatever, you ultimately need to show them that you know how to make something fun. And that's what we'll kind of get into today. And so, um, sorry, Daniel, if that's not good enough for now, it, it really is, you know, again, great, get that great portfolio, try to find some internships, look for some um, online resources or maybe some teams you can join. There's lots of indie teams, there's Facebook groups and stuff like that that are like a bunch of indie developers. And the indie developers um, are looking for people to help them and they'll all make a game together. And so sometimes that experience, even if you're not getting paid, is worth it because you just ultimately have to have something on your resume um, to do that. And then, you know, and if you you know are not in school or haven't thought about school, you know, the other approach is to try to go, you know, come to CG Spectrum or come to another school and, you know, get a degree um, or something like that will help you a little bit as well. But more than, more than the degree or the piece of paper or whatever, it's going to help you build a portfolio, learn skills. And because remember, game design, what we'll talk about starting now is it's not just about like, you know, going into Unreal and building a level. Like anybody and their mother can learn how to, to use Unreal. It's how do you make it fun, right? How, how does fun come in there? And, and that's really the, the challenge. And so that's something that, that we'll, we'll dive into here just in a second. And it's really in a portfolio. Can you design something on paper and implement it into, you know, a game engine and really make it fun? So, all right, let's dive in here. But also, Dan, real quick, I, I also do know that and agree that in, in as far as the internet and the websites and stuff, this is something I've been thinking about how to solve, not just a CG Spectrum, but just in general, because it's hard because I want something that's unbiased, but I do agree that the, the resources for um, people that want to become game designers, the good information and stuff like that's kind of lacking. I have not found a great website um, that really is focused on game design and like, you know, all the stuff you need to know from zero to, you know, being in the industry and everything in between really doesn't exist right now. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. You can find a million sites on for engineering and stuff. And you can find sites with articles on game design, um, Gama Sutra, things like that. But but to find one really focused with great information on like how to get in the industry, how to build a portfolio, how whatever, it just takes a ton of Googling and and trying to figure out who's even telling you the truth, you know, and, and what do you really need to know? So hang in there, you know, and um, and it's perseverance really in the end is, is kind of what you need. So again, I'm not going to get into these types of designers. Um, I do have previous, several previous talks um, on here that, that deep dive into all different types of designers out there. Um, but what I'm after really here is that the commonality of what what are all these designers? Um, what do they all do? Um, what's what's the same? What's different? You know, and you know, and as we progress up the ladder being a, you know, a creative director or our project lead or, or whatever that is, is the top creative person all the way down to, you know, the interns and, 
and everybody in between, you know, for the designers, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is all the same, you know, and, and so as you get higher up in the ranks, you get more responsibility, you know, you get more, um, um, you know, bigger vision of, you know, instead of focusing on one feature, you start having to think about all the features, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, but what's important here is that game designers really, you know, are about fun and we'll get in that, I think on the next slide. Um, and, but you know, artists and engineers, um, and lots of different skill sets. So you could, you can come from, um, no background. If you're just coming out of high school or coming out of another job or whatever, some people come into game design knowing zero, you know, and they're, they're, they're kind of this blank slate and they have no specific skills as an artist, an engineer, or, or some other related area. And then they get into game design and then other people are, um, um, coming in is like, I, I've got some students that are amazing artists, you know, and they come in with basically an art degree and having even worked as an artist and they want to get into like, you know, level design, level art, you know, and things like that. So they want a game design background to, to combine with their art skills. And that's totally valid. And there's other ones that are programmers, you know, and they want to learn how to, you know, be more designy and learn how to design things. And they come in from that way. And so there's no path to entry. There's no, you know, way, there's no common set of skill sets even that are really the same. If you, if you take a, a really big team, you know, with 20 designers on it or a hundred designers on it. Um, and if you look to the background of how all those people got in the industry, you know, and stuff, you'll, you'll find very few people got in the same way, you know, and, and, and function in the same way. And so, um, it's just important to know that, that there's lots of ways to fit in as a game designer. Um, but what you have to do is have some self-realization in the end about like, what are you good at? Right. What, what do you like to do and things like that? And then, you know, and then how do you amplify that, you know, and take advantage of that? Because you have to remember that, you know, not everybody's a jack of all trades. And while being a game designer, it helps tremendously to be a jack of all trades, um, you don't want to be the, the cliche, jack of all trades, master of none, right? And so if you try to spread yourself too thin, you're, you're going to get, you know, in trouble. And that's a big part of the problem. So let's see. Um, so why is this important? You know, so again, you know, I'm kind of stating the obvious here, you know, for stuff, but but you really need to know and, and have the expectations um, for, you know, for what you're going to do, you know, in your job and, and, and knowing kind of like, is this something I really want to do and something I want to get into and, and stuff. And, and, and this is not just true for game design. This is true for anything in careers. In fact, as a funny story, I, I when I was an insomniac, I, I hired a, a guy who had literally gone to law school. So he'd gone through his normal degree program, then went to law school, studied and got, you know, got a job. We got his, passed the bar exam. And I think he worked as a, as a lawyer for three days and then was like, Oh, I hate this job. And he literally quit. And I, I, I never asked how much that cost, but I'm sure that must've been a pretty penny to go all the way through law school and everything. Um, you know, horribly expensive and, and whatever it was, six or eight years of his life, then realized he hated the job and then went back to school and got another degree in game design. And the guy was amazing. He did a great job, you know, and was a great game designer. But like, I hope for everybody else, you figure it out a little bit sooner, <laughs> you know, but, but we all go through these, these, these things of like, you know, what, um, you know, and figuring out who we are and what we are and that can change, you know, over time. Um, but I think part of the reason and what inspired me to do today's talk is that, um, a lot of students are coming in or potential students are coming in and especially like, I can't imagine, I can't believe how many come in and even get started, you know, and they, and they start the program and they literally by like the second day of class, they're upset because they expected to have already made a game and they, they think that they can just jump in and like, you know, and jump into Unreal, learn it in an hour and then it'll be cranking out a game in a couple hours and, you know, and, and that's what they thought that the, that 
making games was about. They 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 think it's a lot about playing games and like just having fun. Like, oh, I can play games all day. Like, that's really cool. Or they think that you know that's well. There's game testers who do that, and that's a whole other story. Of um, you don't want to be a game tester. Trust me. That's that's those guys have a hard job. You know, try playing the same buggy game all day long, over and over. You you want to quit after the first day. It, it's it's not fun being a tester. Um, but game designer, you know, has its own problems too. And and so if you don't understand that game design is work, if you don't understand it's hard, and if you don't understand what what really goes on, then how can you make the right choice about what is this you're going to do? And, and and like I said, I get a lot of students that come in and they just think like. Oh, why do I need to learn all this theory? Why do I need to learn all this stuff? Like, I just need to, you know, get in and build the games, right? And it's like, it doesn't work that way. You know, fun is is very subjective. Fun's very challenging, you know, to figure out. And, you know, it'd be like somebody handing you, you know, a laptop with Adobe Photoshop on it for the very first time. And they're like, okay, you know, I want you to paint, paint a Van Gogh and you got an hour to do it, right? And you're like, uh... Like, I don't even know the program, you know? And then they're like, okay, you can have a day or a week. And you're like, but I don't even know how to draw. Like, I've never even picked up a pencil before and drawn a picture. And now you've given me this complicated program called Photoshop. And you've also expected me to be an artist, like, overnight. Like, that that, that doesn't work. All this stuff takes time and learning and practice, you know, and practice and more practice and more practice, you know, and, and stuff. And so you do want to really understand like what what is that thing that you know that really um excites you right because if you get in and you know you decide you want to design systems or you want to design levels or or whatever if you don't really understand what that job is then then you're going to get in and get frustrated and you know i've had students quit you know or or phase out you know um pretty quickly sometimes because they just didn't really know what they were getting into and I would say that for 99% of the students, um, when I talk about being hard, um, especially on the technical side. Now, again, you don't have to be a programmer. I want to set the line, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. You don't have to be a programmer to be a game designer. Um, but you do need to understand, you know, and be semi-technical, or at least designers in general who are, especially if you're doing this on your own, if you're, um, if you're doing this... Um, Without any technical skills, it's much harder, right? And 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 stuff. And so, um, having that technical understanding is important. And again, some people jump in with no technical skills, very little math, very little like whatever, and then they don't get why they're having such a hard time. And it's because there's a lot of the concepts around engineering, programming, scripting, you know, all that kind of stuff are are the the the, the programs like Unreal Engine are very complicated. You know, and if you at least don't have the mindset to to think in an engineering way, if you think like an artist, so to speak, um, you know, the, the logic behind how and why you do things as a game designer isn't going to make sense, and that's what's hard. Hi, the fallen one. Welcome. Let me see what I've. Um... Yeah, so so I've been trying. Um... I've tried to be on people to my team wanted to learn how to design a game. They all end up quitting within a month because it was too hard. I'm still making my game solo. Yeah, so you're trying to bring um, them. So, yes, I absolutely agree. I mean, and what's funny is, like, even even the ideation of a game, um, and and we'll get, get into that in a second, like, it's funny how many times people think, like, I play games all day long, and, like, oh, ideas are easy, and so how hard can this be? And you'll just be like, okay, you know, write, you know, like one of the first assignments I give is like, write like a two pager, you know, just the, you know, outline of what this game is. And, you know, and at first I, I was giving people about eight hours to do this. And I don't know if anybody was able to do it in that time. I think some people were taking like eight days, you know, and some were taking even, I think some said they took 40 plus hours or, 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 or more, um, to, um, to do that, but it's, yeah, the following one, yeah, everybody wants to be the idea guy, right? And it sounds really easy, and, and you know, and you're, you can talk all day long, like, yeah, I want this game, and I want all this stuff, and we're going to do all these things. I'm like, okay, great, put it down on paper. And they're like, ah, that's really hard. Like, I actually have to think through and, you know, and realize what I'm doing, right? Um, so what's important to understand, you know, if you, if you don't get this conceptually, is that 
everything in a game, like every little teeny tiny thing is an idea that somebody had and somebody had to make work. And, and so everything was a conscious thought. There, we don't just close our eyes and like shake a bag of magic and have things appear. I, well, maybe these days with randomization and stuff we do, but, but I mean, we're, we're, we are consciously making every choice. You know, how fast does this guy run? How many guns does he have? How much ammo does he have? How fast does he shoot? What's the AI doing? What's the world look like? You know, is it day? Is it night? I mean, and the, the, the list is a, a million miles long of, of decisions that as game designers, we have to make and we have to make them fun. And then we have to make them balanced and we have to, you know, do all these things. And oh, we have this technology box, you know, well, I don't care whether it's an Xbox One X or whatever, there's limits. And so we have to work within the limits of our hardware. We've got to work within the limits of our development team and budget and time, you know, and everything else. And so when it, when, when it all comes together and you actually try to be the idea guy, that job is 10 times harder than people realize. I'd say 100 times harder. And I, I agree that the, the, the most people tend to fail there because they think that being a game designer is just about being the idea guy. And there's a saying that's, that's so true in our industry that ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution is everything. And I really, truly believe in that. And, I, and I've seen a million, I mean, not joking, a million ideas fail because they were, they were great ideas. They weren't great games, right? And there's a difference. There's a difference of am I taking something that's just and being the idea guy or am I actually like going to, um, you know, make a real game out of this? And then suddenly it's like, oh, wait, how do I actually make make this function? How do I make this work? How do I actually implement this? Ooh, that's hard. You know, that, that gets kind of scary. And so, and then as the idea guy and as this designer, um, you know, the quote here at the bottom, you know, of the screen right now, you know, nobody thinks they're a programmer if they're not, nobody thinks they're an artist if they're not, but everybody thinks they're a game designer. hundred percent true. You'll hear me say that five times today or more. Um, and one of the hardest parts of this job is as the idea guy, Everybody thinks they're an idea guy, right? And so ultimately, can you make a great idea, but can you also sell it? Can you can you implement it? Do you know how to build it? You know, and that's what we're going to get into. Like, how do you really do that? You know, and so that's the that's the really um, um, difficult part. Um, so let's see here. Um, go through some. Um, Text. So thank you everybody for, for speaking up and chatting with me today. Um, yeah, so organizing and completing ideas is a rough process. Um, and um, if you guys haven't seen, um, I have a couple of my previous videos on ideation and um, on systemic game design. And if you guys haven't watched those and you're into game design, um, the following one, that's exactly what I talk about, is really like how do you organize those ideas and how do you build those into stuff. And then even in the last my last few streams, when I was building my game idea, I implemented those things to try to show you guys how to do it. It's, it's not rocket science. It's not as hard as you think. But it is when you start the first time, it's, it's really challenging. But being organized and learning how to take your ideas and put them down on paper and then, and then build them out conceptually uh, is a really critical skill. And I do have some previous talks that really do, that go into super depth on that, um, which I highly recommend. Um, and so, yes. And, and Daniel, um, so yes, a GDD is a game design document. Um, and a game design document is, you know, is something, and just to be clear, like everybody's definition of GDD is different. Um, and yes, the following one talks about, yeah, the, um, there is templates and, and stuff like that. Um, but, um, the, um, the, the problem with GDDs is a smaller indie team might get away with five, 10, 20 pages, um, and just a simple high level overview. Um, but the larger your team gets, the more process driven your team gets. And if you get into working with publishers like an EA, Microsoft, Ubisoft, companies like that, um, they require much, much, much more process. And so, so I, I have written documents as big as a thousand pages, um, just as a GDD. And so a game design document covers every little system, every little thing like, okay, how do I walk? How do I run? How do I talk? You know, I mean, like every little thing gets covered in that GDD. Um, in general, the, the, the archaic kind of way of doing it is to go off and write one big document and say, okay, guys, boom, here's your, 
here's your document. Go implement this because I am God and I tell you what to do, you know, and do what I say, you know. Um, and that was the way sometimes it was done in the past. And that's not a great way, right? Um, so this is a living document. It should be interactive. It's constantly updated and it's built as you go. It's built to the detail level that your team needs, that your people needs, that your project needs, that your publisher needs. Um, and so that's why it's really hard to, um, to find great examples because every company is all over the place. Um, within my program at CG Spectrum, we do teach you how to write really detailed design documents because that's where our program is focused on building AAA games for big studios. And, and I feel that if you know how to build the big one, then it's not so hard to write the small one. But if you know, you know, if you teach people how to only do this and then they realize they get on a big team, they've got to go write something really big and really scary, they're going to fail. And so we do tend to teach the bigger, um, the bigger ones. Um, but yeah, within my program, I do give out a lot of examples, but yeah, you can Google, um, game design documents and some companies have released their, their documents officially. So it is very interesting to look at some existing documents to kind of see what a GDD is. Um, oh, Daniel, um, side question. Do we take the, um, uh, GI bill or similar veteran scholarships? Not that I know of currently. Um, however, we are looking into um, and building some partnerships that I can't announce yet, but they're very close, um, like maybe in the next few months um, with some schools that are going that we are going to be working with in the U.S. Um, and from my understanding, those schools will have um, in the U.S. full accreditation um, with um, and probably would be able to take all that. So while we can't take it today, um, I think we can take it in the next couple months. So. The best thing you can do, if that's how you want to try to get into it, um, go to our website um, and email our, our um, I believe it's info at cgspectrum.com. And if you um, contact us there, um, we'll get back to you on some details and some information. But there should there should be some stuff coming really soon about that, you know, that I, I believe. But I'm not sure on the GI Bill side of things exactly. But um, CG Spectrum, we're actually based out of Australia. And so we're, we're still trying to get all the U.S. stuff fully approved, you know, when it comes to um, any kind of financial aid packages and stuff like that, because it takes a little bit of time for that. But we're, we're in process with that. So hopefully that helps you. But hopefully I'd love to see you in the program if you can get out here someday. But again, you know, if not, please go back and watch the rest of my live streams. There's I don't even know how many hours now of, you know, 80 hours or something you know, of me rambling on about all sorts of stuff. So I hope if anything, you get to use that as a great resource for yourself. And um, so, yeah, so the following one, exactly. So it's, it's, it's the GDD is a very, um, very detailed document, you know, that's basically written. And think of this as like a foundation. I One, one last analogy I'll use you know, and why um, documents are so important. And we'll, we'll get that a little bit more, I think, just in a couple slides here. Um, one of the reasons, think about like making a house, right? If you're, if you worked in construction, you know, like, do you want to design the house with a floor plan on paper with an architect, you know, and, and, and do you know what that house is, right? Like, okay, do, does somebody just, do, if you had a job, if you're an architect, right? And you're building a house, um, does somebody just say, go build a house? And you're like, okay, like what's my budget? How big is it supposed to be? What's its use? Is it single family, multifamily? You know, is it, you know, 20,000 square feet or 200 square feet? Is it, you know, how many bedrooms? How many baths? How many this? How many that? Like you, you need to know and design these things, right? Like you, you want to plan all that stuff out. You want to think about how people use the house. You want to think about where it's convenient. You don't, you don't put all the bedrooms over on over here and then like, you know, have this big long house and all the bathrooms are way over here so that when you wake up in the middle of the night and you really got to go, you got like a hundred meters to cross. Like, I mean, there, there's things that make sense when people use product, right? And I don't care whether that product is a software product, whether that's a house you're building or anything in the world things have what we call usability, which we'll get into. And, and so, um, so in the same way that you would build a blueprint or you'd build an architectural plan for a house, um, that's what any kind of design thinking is what 
you know, uh, my program especially does a lot of work in because you, you have to know how to conceptualize, how to think about your users, think about what they're going to do. Is this a house that's, that's friendly for kids? Is this a house that's, you know, um, made for adults? Is it a house that's made for people with disabilities and needs to be wheelchair accessible? All that kind of stuff. Those same ideas all work in games. Those same concepts, you know, all work. Who's your target audience? What are their needs? You know, those kinds of things. And so, we have to know how to do that, right? We we have to know how to how how to do those things, and and so um, you know you could you could drive up, you know, have a big semi truck pull up to a piece of property and drop off a bunch of lumber and and then a bunch of building materials and say and somebody can tell you like build a house, you know, with no floor plan and you'll build up something and then tear it down and rebuild it and tear it down and rebuild it. And you probably will eventually build a house. But like, how much money did you make? You know, did, how much money did you do? The extra money did that cost you? You know, how much time did it cost you? You know, all these things because you didn't stop to plan, right? And so we'll get in a little bit about agile development, and agile uh, methodologies. You know, which is basically building without a plan or or with a very very loose plan. And then there's so there's times and places to really detail out a design, and there's times and places where you just want to kind of build stuff and try it and you know and you can only talk about stuff for so long at some point you have to implement it and that's this weird fuzzy area that game designers get into that's really challenging and so um hi ron um let me see how much does each department utilize game design documents does everyone dip into it constantly depends on the company depends on the teams depends on a lot of factors um i definitely I would say the majority of teams that I work with, um, whether you're an engineer, you know, especially engineers, um, engineers and designers are in the GDD daily, whether they're contributing to it or reading it or, or, or you know, programming something to it. Um, I would say that artists um, don't use it as much. But, but again, like the more that you can design things sometimes, you know, th- it really depends on your team and your project. As an example, like as for if I was going to design a character, right? I mean, in the end, you'd see, let's say it's a monster, and I'm going to design a dragon, you know, some kind of a new dragon. And, you know, like, do I do, do, do I just tell the artist, design a dragon? And maybe that's okay, because he might know what a dragon is, and so maybe it gets partly there. But if I'm like, okay, go design an alien, right? Well, what do I want? Like, is, is the alien 10 feet tall? Is he 100 feet tall? Is he is he mean? Is he cute? Do I want to go up and hug him or do I want to kill him? Is he going to eat me? Like, what, what what's this thing do? What's its function, right? So artists work in form. Artists work in like, how, how does something look? But it needs some functionality, right? Does this thing have weapons? Does it attack? Does it, how fast does it move? You know, all these things need to, to work together. And so as a designer, I, I still will write up, you know, something that will tell an artist like, hey, you know, maybe it's a one pager, maybe it's a paragraph, maybe it's a sentence, but I might give them, you know, and then I also will then go Google some images and I will tell them like, here's, you know, I found some cool stuff. Like, what do you think about this drawing by Sid Mead? What do you think about this? And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like this and if you want to change it all, go ahead. But this is kind of where my head's thinking about stuff. And here's the, the functionality I need. I need it to go fast. I need it to, you know, take on lots of damage. I need it to be really scary, you know, and I'll give them some specifications and then the artist will then go try to make that the best they can, you know, and get the form and function working together. And it's an iterative process. They may, that's why they may start with a silhouette wet start with concept art something really fast really dirty and i'm like oh no that like that doesn't work that's not great you, know, you just put 20 arms on this thing and i can't i can't animate 20 arms there's a technical limitation right so so again designers are often in these gdds in these specifications in these documents are helping guide the team into a vision that somebody has you know that's gonna that's gonna function um, for technical reasons, as well as for gameplay and ultimately for fun, right? Is this thing gonna gonna be fun, right? So, um, no, I have not seen um, the following. I have not seen Nuclino.com for a new GD website that was template or built from scratch. No, I've not seen that. I'll have to um, give me one second. I want just so I don't lose it in the. Oops. I want to just. All right.
This is the, the site that... All right, well, that looks interesting. Um, Y'all yeah, definitely check that out. So um, thanks for that one. And I'll, I will see, um, see how that looks. Um, there is lots of things on the market. I mean, people can... Um, let's see here. Back to that. Um, you know, can design documents in a lot of different ways. But what's really important is getting the right information at the right time. And that's, again, I've, I've given a bunch of talks previously on GDDs and things like that. So I don't want to, I don't want to deep dive too deeply into that. Um, and, um, and so that's the, you know, that, that's why it's so difficult. So Daniel said, all properties and assets in the game must be designed with a purpose and nature determined beforehand for the artists. If possible, yes, that that is the um, that is what you want to try and do. Um, although you know, I've worked with amazing artists that I don't have to give them much direction. I'll be like, okay, guys, go make twenty characters, right? And they'll like do a great job, and they'll come out, and then I might tweak, 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 but I don't necessarily give them a lot of direction because I know and trust them that they know they know what type of things to work on. So, you know, when you're, when you're with a very seasoned team and you're with a team that like knows what it's doing, especially if it's working on an IP that already exists, if I'm going to go, you know, create star Wars or something like that, like that's a whole different approach than if I'm making my own original IP. And so that's why, again, like every game is a little bit different, right. And, and stuff, but in general, um, most artists, um, and most programmers, like to be given some generalized direction at an absolute minimum. Um, and then I would argue that for a significant amount of programmers, especially, um, programmers like to often be told exactly what to do. Like, like, you know, and again, this depends. There, there's definitely programmers who are like, okay, just point me in the right direction and let me figure it out. Um, but the vast majority of programmers realize they're not game designers, luckily. And they want to know every little teeny tiny detail, you know, to the nth degree. And, you know, you can write really huge documents so that they don't have to think at all. They don't have to design. They'll just like, oh, okay, this one has this, that, this, that, this, that, and this, that, and does this and does that. And they can just implement that stuff and code it and not have to, you know, think about it. Right. So that's something that, that's important to, to kind of understand. Let's see here. So the following one, my biggest thing right now is finding the artists. Yeah, it, I mean, when you're trying to put together game teams and you're not um, um, paying, so to speak, and you might be, you know, a lot of teams try to do this where they're trying to put together nights and weekends kind of projects and teams and, and stuff. Um, there's some Facebook groups and stuff like that that are really good for trying to put people together. And I think there's a lot of students out there who are willing to do work for free if it helps get them some experience. Um, you know, I, I think most of us are smart enough to know that, you know, the promise of rev share and getting money out of the game selling is kind of a one in a million, you know, thing that most, most games from Indies are not going to go out and make enough money to really make you a lot of money. I mean, there's, there's exceptions, right? We all dream about that. Um, but, Really, as a student, what you're really after is experience, right? And portfolio, like I talked about in the beginning. And so um, so try to sell the artists on what the benefits are to them beyond just um, um, to them beyond just the um, like, hey, maybe you can make some money someday, right? If it's about the money, it's not going to be that interesting. Sell them on the opportunity to make something really great. So, you know, the, 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 the real job of a designer is really about creating, you know, and, and like I've talked about, it's about creating fun. It's, it's the mechanics, that second to second, you know, um, gameplay, you know, and how does it feel, you know, um, how, you know, how do I run, how do I jump, double jump, you know, and then how do I shoot my gun while I'm jumping and targeting an enemy, you know, and switch weapons, you know, how do I reload? And then, you know, how do I heal? And like all these kinds of things. And then how's that fit into this, in this area of the map that I'm in? You know, do I have cover to hide behind? Do I have to keep running? You know, where are the enemies? What's the enemy? Are they other humans? Are they AIs? You know, um, what are those things, right? And all these things 
when there's there's literally millions of these things that you have to decide on, right? That there's not it's the, the hard part with design is there's not necessarily right or wrong answers. There's definitely some stuff of like, yeah, you shouldn't have done that, like you know, and and there's definitely stuff of like, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, but in general, it, it's really you know that that's the subjective nature of being a game designer is like. Well, do I want a run and gun shoot? You know, do I want a game that's run and gun? Do I want a game that's cover based? Do I want a game that's stealth based? Right? There's not a right or wrong answer there. They're just different kinds of games, right? Um, but at some point, you've got to make a decision, you know, um, and you got to figure out how to create that, right? And 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 how to make it all work together. Um, and it's a lot easier said than done, you know. And that's definitely something that's that's a challenge. Um. Let's see here. So Daniel, would design portfolio mostly be games they've shipped or is there smaller parts of it or how does one go about building a portfolio? Again, that's a, a really, really, really long conversation and um, I think, um, I forget who somebody asked, asked that earlier. Um, so again, the, the portfolio is really a mix of, of documents. Um, you know, so writing GDDs, pitch decks, you know, all those kind of things all the way through, you know, white boxes and level designs and, and implementation. So you could, you can build anything. It doesn't have to be a full game. It can just be, you know, a little corner, a little prototype, um, you know, things like that. But it depends on, you want to build your portfolio to be the kinds of games that you want to make in the end. So for example, you could try to, you know, you could go build a, a mobile version of Candy Crush and be like, "Hey, I made I made a game that's ten times better than Candy Crush," and here you know, and here it is. And then you you know, and then you go apply to to work on the next Call of Duty, and those skills aren't really transferable. Like they're very <laughs> different, right? And so so you could have the strongest portfolio in the world in one area or a couple areas, and then and still not be qualified in their eyes. Um, to go work on another genre of game and that's you know or another platform even the mobile and console worlds are very different the you know and and and, and they don't like to cross over they're very jaded you know so if you've been a mobile game designer for a long time it can be really hard um, to get in and and become a console designer um, and in fact one of our students right now who's really doing well actually worked professionally as, for several years as a mobile game designer at a decently sized company, and all that, and he tried to transfer over into consoles. He couldn't do it. it the skill set didn't transfer, so he came and is taking. He's currently taking our program to learn how to be to get into PC console design because it's just even PC console and mobile are such different beasts that, that even that knowledge doesn't transfer terribly well. Um, some of the foundational stuff does, um, but but there is just a lot of very subtle differences that make it hard for you to cross even between those two worlds. And so, so keep that in mind that when you're building a portfolio, you really want to build towards something that you see or dream of. But again, keep an open enough mind that, that you're willing to kind of work on anything. Um, you know, I, I've done almost every genre in the world, but like, I know, like I hate sports, so I stay away from sports. I will not, you know, um, work on a sports game. I've worked on some sports ish games that were fighting and wrestling and things like that, that kind of were considered sports. But you know, like me going and doing a basketball, soccer, football game, couldn't do it. Like wouldn't, I have zero interest. I have no experience, no skill set. So even after 30 years, I, I can't do that. So my, my portfolio even of, of ship games or even example games, whatever has no, no examples in that area. So I'm never going to get a job there. Right. It's, it's just, it's just not, you know, so, so that's part of the problem in, in games. You got to figure out what you want to be and build a portfolio that reinforces that as well. Um, um, so the following one, um, I don't know the, I don't remember the exact prices there. I believe our, our courses are about eight to 10,000 us dollars a year. Um, on our website, um, cgspectrum.com, it's I guess listed right there on the on the stream. Um, there is a there's pricing there for both individuals and classes, so you can get the exact prices there. Um, and no, it's not learn at your own pace. It is a um, each term is is twelve weeks, um, and each and there's a two week break in between, 
and um, each week is about 20 hours or more of work, and and you really can't um, self-guide it because every week you work with a mentor. One of our things is you have a, a mentor who you talk to every week on Zoom, and either one-on-one -on -one or in a class of up to four people, and so you, you've got to deliver every week. It's not a like, oh, I'll get to that in a couple weeks or, or whatever. We can't do that because you've got to stay in your class. You've got to stay on time, and a big part of our cost is paying for our mentors because all of our mentors are actually working professionals. A lot of them work at Ubisoft and EA and big companies. You know, they're really, really amazing designers. Um, um, but we, we can't just be like, oh, well, talk to this guy in a few weeks when he needs you. So it really is a, you know, um, like you're, you're going to school. Like this, this is a real, CG Spectrum is a real legit school. Think of it like a trade school in the sense that it's a crash course. You're doing this, you know, in, in four 12 week terms, you know, not taking four years. And, um, it's much more practical in its nature, um, and much more hands on. But yeah. I mean, occasionally if you needed a problem and you need to delay a couple weeks or something, that might be arrangeable. But for the most part, once you start, you gotta you gotta keep going. Um Yeah, so I understand it, it's difficult and balancing everything. You just have to decide what you want. But but I, I like to be realistic that twenty hours a week is really the minimum. And the students that do really, really well are spending 30, 40 hours a week. Because they got to get the portfolios looking amazing and and stuff, and so you know if, if you can't afford the time to, to really put that in, you're not gonna you're not gonna get out of it what you need. And and so um, as much as you know, we'd love to have you, of course, and all that. But be re be realistic with yourself, your time, your family. I get it. It's it's really hard to um, to balance all of that. And I've been there and I've done that, you know, and. and um, so, but, but you got to also think about what you're willing, what you're willing to sacrifice to also get a new career and be happy. You're right. So it's always about balance. So this is, this is a, we'll call this a table of contents. Um, I am not going to dive into this. So I have slides now on every one of these topics, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys a, a quick understanding that, that how many things that we do as a game designer. This is not everything. This this is just like high level of uh, like generalization of, of what we do, you know, as a game designer. And so um, I want you guys to kind of just kind of see that there, there's a million different skill sets, you know, that we have to make fun. We have to research, communicate, solve problems, plan, you know, write stuff, implement gameplay, implement levels, design interfaces, test and tune more. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and you'll see throughout this whole talk, you know, and, and the rate we're going, this will probably be a part two next week to continue this. Um, but I want you to see it, it, it can be overwhelming, right? It, there, there's a now you don't need to know and be a master of all this stuff. Like, I am still learning how to be a game designer after 30 years, right? I'm still learning new tips, new tricks, new ways, new techniques, and, and learning how to apply it. and you know, run big teams, small teams, any teams, and everything in between, you know, and, and, and it's always changing. The industry is always changing, you know, going again from like mobile to console and then, you know, a indie mobile game to a triple A mobile game. And like every one of those situations has a different set of rules and a different set of things I do, you know, working on a thousand person team or a 10 person team, you know, all are dramatically different. Right. And so, so you know, what you end up doing is really going to depend on what your team is. Because most of the time, not always, but but most of the time, a game is made by a team. You know, there's a few exceptions. A few good games have come out by a person or even two or three people that made it. Um, but, you know, for today's conversation, we are talking about making professional games, you know, and not indie stuff. And, and that means that, you know, you're realistically going to have you know, a minimum team of probably 20 people. Um, and realistically, probably teams of 50 to 100 people as you get into bigger projects. And then, you know, big AAA teams. Um, if you look at the Halo team, if you look at Bungie, if you look at Call of Duty, if you look at a lot of these, the, the really big AAA projects, all together, those teams are easily over a 1,000 people. And quite often for, you know, and it takes us about two years to make a game on average. If we're doing, again, big AAA stuff could take two, three years. And as we know, some games are five or seven years. So, I mean, but two or three is kind of an average production if nothing goes horribly bad. 
Um, so if you think about a thousand people over two years, you know, um, that's 2000 man years, you know, of, of time. Right. And then, you know, and, and if your average person makes, you know, if you took an average salary and I'm, I'm just making a round number here, this is not what the average salary is, but if you'd said everybody makes, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, at 2000, you know, of those, like, you can see why the the cost of games has gotten so ridiculous lately, um, and so that's why it's it's a challenge. And, and indies can do really well, but it's it's really 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 hard to make a game as an indie by yourself or with with just a couple people because the the skill set is so vast, you know, and and so hard. And so yes, with contractors these days and other stuff, we can do things like outsource writing, outsource audio, outsource art you know, localization, you know, lots of things can get outsourced these days um, that was a lot harder to outsource years ago. Um, but it's still just a really hard problem that we have to solve. Yes. So the following one, it's, it's always a, you know, everything's always changing. And that's, that's the secondary problem that we're always, always facing. Um, so Ron, um, any advice on how to decide upon a design direction if someone hasn't worked in video games before? Narrative combat, content systems. Um, that is, that's a really hard question. Um, I do have a bunch of other talks in my past that, I, that I've deep dived into that. I don't want to um, ignore you on this, but that I could literally spend hours and hours and hours trying to give you the right answer there. Um, the, the, the key is really you know, start with kind of something, you know, and, and, and it, I, I see it as an 80, 20 rule or 70, 30, meaning like, okay, you know, I want to make a first person shooter. I want to make it modern, you know, so I start with call of duty, you know, and then like, how do I now differentiate it? How do I add two, three, four things that, that make it really different? Um, but every game comes out of a different place. And again, I've got lots of talks on this in my past channels. Um, but the, um, you know, um, yes, Ron, so in the same channel, um, you're on YouTube right now. So just go to our CG Spectrum um, um, YouTube channel. And I've got, if you look up game design there, I think this is, again, like my, um, I don't remember which number of talk this is. But I, I'm, I'm approaching almost 100 hours of content there that it, just for myself. And then CG Spectrum has um, lots of other um, uh, mentors and teachers that are also giving talks there on 3D art and concept art and, and other areas um, almost every single day, if not every day right now. We have a, at least a two-hour live stream every day on different topics. Not only, I'm the only one doing game design, but there's lots of other topics there. So, so check it out. But again, I think there's 3540 um, other talks all two hours long for me on various topics there. So um, I do talk about world building, ideation, and a whole bunch of stuff like that that'll help you kind of understand that. But that's a really big topic. And, and you'll see even my world building talk is is probably like 10 or 20 hours long just in that one subject. And that's really like how do you design something, where do you start from, and, and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a deep, complicated problem. And, you know, that's why they pay me to do what I do because that's, you know, it's, it's not as easy as, as people think. So, one of the first jobs, you know, that we do is one of the things we do, um, especially initially in the beginning of our game, you know, and, but I would say that at some levels this never ends, is research. And, you know, and again, this is, it, and what is research? It's learning, right? And so, I'll give you an example of like Rainbow Six. Um, if you guys have played Rainbow Six and, um, and which was, I was the project lead for Rainbow Six Vegas, you know, and luckily, you know, I was raised by a father who was uh, a Marine. And, and so I was raised with around a lot of military stuff and, and, and things. And so I had, a, I, I had a decent understanding of, of those things, but I've never served and don't know it intimately. Um, but I had, um, if you look at my, not this bookshelves here, but on the other side of my house where I've got all my reference books, I literally have dozens of shelves of books, you know, half of which are military. Like, 
military tactics, uniforms, you know, special forces, everything you can imagine, you know, and then these days Google, I mean, pretty much supplanted all of that and YouTube and everything else. So like the old school days of buying books is kind of gone. Um, but I do talk about this in my world building and in some of my other classes. So I'm not going to deep dive in here. Um, uh, thank you, Daniel, for your service. And, um, and like I said, my dad was a Marine sniper as well. So I, you know, I kind of grew up in that, um, in that type of a household. Um, the, um, you know, but, but that knowledge gave me some ability to do a, a good game because I, I really knew a lot about to start with, but I spent months and months and months, you know, even when the game was already being designed, I still, every night, like, I'd be reading my book on, you know, military tactics and thinking up ideas and, and stuff like that. And so when you play certain games, you know, and, and things like when I designed Age of Empires, when I designed, you know, um, um, you know, Rainbow Six, games like that, you know, some of what sets them apart is they're very authentic, right? And so I, somebody has to figure out like, okay, what kind of guns am I going to use? What kinds of weapons am I going to use? You know, how how are the guys dressed? Like, what's their uniforms? How they talk? What's the language they're using? Are they, are they, you know, all the way down to the hand signals my guys were using in Rainbow or even Crack. So even as they're using and, and doing animated hands and they would be like kind of talking to each other with hand signals, the actual way their hands, you know, moved was real special forces like hand signals. Um, so the, the, the type of research... I do can be really, really deep, right? Um, and that could be from playing competitive games. I watch movies, you know, on that theme, you know, or and everything else. Now, if you're doing an original IP, you might say like, oh, I got nothing to watch because there's nothing like what I'm making. Be careful. Like that's that's a dangerous thing. If you if, if if there's nothing in the world that's not like you in theme or in gameplay or whatever else, you're probably got a bad idea because people really don't like 100% new stuff. They they like familiar. They like stuff that's there. But you got to understand what what Hollywood reality is versus you know versus real reality. And a lot of times, people's expectations of what they think is real or they think something is comes out of Hollywood or comes out of, you know, um, a game they played or something like that. And they think that's real much more than, you know, they never bothered to read the book or, or study history or whatever to know what truly happened, you know, sometimes. So it is kind of funny. And so this research that we're doing is about, you know, understanding our players, understanding our users, understanding our competition, understanding how to, you know, how are we going to sell this thing, expand this thing, make it fun, you know. So we're doing... All of this kind of research, um, you know, and like, and I get very obsessive about it. Like, like even if I'm doing a game that's science fiction, I will just like literally almost everything I watch, everything I listen to, everything I do is sci-fi. Like, I'm just, I will literally absorb myself for years sometimes in a genre or something because I just like to know what all is out there and, and what the competition is doing, whether I'm using those ideas or not, but it's really important for me to kind of see this big picture. And I spend so much time on every project researching it. And if you're doing like an IP like Star Wars, you like, you know, um, you'll see here, if you can kind of tell lots of uh, statue, I, I, I actually bought it in Bangkok, Thailand, but it was, it's Boba Fett, you know, and I worked on a Boba Fett game and I literally, um, um, I literally did, I read every single book, every single comic, every single bit of information on Boba Fett that existed in the, in the universe because there was no Bible that gave me a timeline for him. And, and so I needed to figure him out. And, it, and it's hard with all the expanded Star Wars universe. I mean, and I loved it. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, that, that best job ever, right? Get like, cause I love Boba Fett and he was my favorite character, you know, through the Star Wars movies. So to get to make a game on him and get to, you know, do all this research on him was like a fantastic opportunity. And I thought it was really funny because eventually I knew so much about him that even Lucas licensing was calling me asking me questions about Boba Fett because I was the only person that literally had compiled, you know, the total information on Boba Fett and, um, so, no, Daniel, it wasn't 1313. This was a, a Boba Fett game back. This was actually before Episode 1 came out. And um, so back in the Dark Ages on PS2. And um, and so the we, we ended up redoing the game as Star Wars Bounty Hunters, um, which was an older um, PS2 game. Um, 
this was the if you guys can see that okay. So this this is ultimately what the game turned into. Um bah. and so um but we had to re we had to rejigger it a bunch of times. Um and and this game, one of the reasons that it got so messy um was that when I was working on the game, this was at so Star Wars episodes four, five, and six came out, right? The first three. And then there was a pretty big time gap between that and when episodes one, two, and three came out. Well, um, in the whole mythos of Star Wars, um, Boba Fett um, was was actually killed at the end of it. You know, when he fell into the Sarlacc pit, um, he was killed. And then, but the fan outrage was so much that they wanted to bring him back. And so then they wrote all the stuff about like how he survived the Sarlacc pit and all these things. But George meant to kill him off. And then, the, you know, we brought him back through the, through all the fan stuff. And then, um, um, and then, but when episode one came out, um, George decided to introduce Jenga Fett as Boba Fett's father, and there was no information. I mean, this was a whole new made-up thing. It completely changed the canon, but because it came from George, he could do whatever he wanted to do. And so um, my game was all based on Boba Fett, and then suddenly episode one was coming out about the same time that my game was coming out. And we literally got a call one day saying like, well, you need to put a hold on your game. Like, we got a problem. And I'm like, and they're like, Jenga Fett. And I'm like, Jenga who? What? <laughs> you know, and like, like whole storyline changed. So that messed us up really bad. Um, but there's just stuff like that happens. And that's, but that's part of the research, part of, you know, knowing what you're working with um, and, um, and all that. And it, it's hard, but then things can change too. And so that's where it just, it, it's as a game designer, um, you know, we really need to understand these things. We need to understand, you know, what we're building and whether we're building something out of somebody else's universe. Um, it could be based on a movie um, or it could be based on the spirit of the game. Um, like even um, Bruce Lee here, I'm going to show you the extent of, of the research. So for any of you guys that played this on the Xbox that I designed, um, you know, um, the, the original storyline from this, um, is actually from Bruce. Um, so believe it or not, Bruce had actually written a bunch of movie scripts. He didn't finish them, um, before his death, but he had a bunch of stuff that was there. And when we signed them with the license and then, um, I got to meet and work very closely with, um, Bruce's wife, um, Linda, his daughter, Shannon. And, um, and so in the process of working with them, they're like, Hey, we got some old scripts that Bruce wrote. You know, do you want to check them out? And ultimately, one of them was great, and we turned it into a game um, loosely. And um, but to show the extent of this, um, not only did I obviously go watch his movies, um, but what people don't know is Bruce actually wrote a bunch of books. Um, he wrote a bunch of books on um, Jeet Kune Do and the Way of the Fist and, and like his philosophy of martial arts and things like that. So I went and read all that. Um, and then I actually started. Um, I, I had a small background in doing some martial arts before that. But I actually found um, this guy, Tommy Gong, who was the student of, of um, the only person who was ever certified um, by Bruce as, um, as an actual JKD teacher. And so, uh, and then Tommy was his protege. So I went and trained for two years in Jeet Kune Do. And I, and I studied martial arts and I learned how Bruce moved. I learned how he, how he fought, you know, and stuff. So it wasn't even just like, you know, and this is an action adventure game. I didn't need to know that, but for me, that was an important part of, of putting myself and understanding what Bruce would do and understanding the philosophies and the ways and things like that. And that helped my relationship with the Lee family, um, tremendously. And, and then Shannon and Linda, you know, learned to trust me through that because they knew that I had Bruce's best interest in mind. And, and I, I, and I went way above and beyond. But for me, that research and that necessary to, to really understand who Bruce was as a person, who he was as an actor, who he was as a father and all these things. And I, and how I worked that all into my game and, and the types of moves you could do, the types of, of stuff that you had, um, and all that, it, it, you know, it made, the game had had its faults for some other reasons and you know it wasn't the greatest game in the world um we had some technology issues and stuff um but you know but those are the kind that's the kind of research that i would get into and do with these things same with like you know even you know gun games when we're doing you know call of duty or you know medal of honor when i was helping on that a little bit and stuff like we'd literally take everybody out and go to the gun range and shoot guns and you know and and stuff because it's you know 
half the team ain't ever shot a gun and they're trying to make a, a game about guns, right? So research isn't just about you know, reading a book or watching a movie or whatever, but it's really like, what do you need to know to understand to really do your job and make something great? Um, so the fall one, as far as real world locations, that's a gray area. Um, if you use any brands, you know, if you had a Starbucks or if you had something like that, um, generally, yes, you do need permission from, from most of those people. If you want to use, their stuff, but but again, you have to ask yourself, like, if I'm just going to put it in Los Angeles, no, I don't have to have permission. But if I want to have, you know, um, a particular business, you know, in a particular location, and it has to be that business name or whatever, then yes, you're going to need to search permissions for a lot of those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, but just like movies do or whatever, like, can it just be something that's made up? You know, and there could be a coffee shop on the corner, but does it need to be Starbucks, right? Um and that's that's the question you kind of have to ask yourself. So how realistic do you need to make it? And therefore, you know, um, and, and keep in mind when you make really realistic games, this is this is another part of the. We'll put this in research right now, I guess, because it's it's a gray area. But especially when anything's made something that's kind of realistic, like let's take even Rainbow Six again. Um, like, I can argue and say, like, well, you know, this gun shoots at so many frames per second, you know, so many feet per second at this, you know, at this rate of fire with this much accuracy at this distance. I could model a, we'll call it a simulation to try to, to make this weapon perfectly accurate and realistic, right? And every gun can have just its exact modeling of what the real gun in the real world is going to do. I can put you in Fallujah with the, you know, exact perfect map that just maps out one to one exactly with the real the real place, the real location. I can make all that exactly realistic. Is that fun? Probably not. You know, and so ask yourself as a game designer, where do you cross the line between fun and simulation? Right. And that's, th this is what research is kind of about, right? It, it's about understanding our players and understanding. And that's why when I came in and took over the Rainbow franchise, um, one of my mandates was to make a more casual game that, that more people could enjoy that was more mass market because a lot of the previous games had really kind of crossed into that simulation side where it was like one shot, one kill and much more realistic weapons. And it just, it wasn't forgiving. And so it became almost like a puzzle game because, you know, you take two steps forward and boom, you're dead. And you're like, oh, somebody shot me. And like, I can't even heal. I can't recover, you know, and, and those kinds of things. And so with Vegas, we, we really, we, we give it a sense of authenticity. We give it a sense of realism. You know, a lot of, a lot of stuff is real on the surface, but when it comes to fun, um, fun is a totally different job that you got to do. And in the end, our responsibility as game designers is to make something fun. So be careful about making things too realistic and, and define that word realistic. Define your needs to have something in a real place. You know, is every street and road the, the same width, the same length, the same height buildings, the same, you know, you know, every store is the same. You know, do you really, is that really what you want to build? You know, um, because is that fun, right? GTA feels like it's a, a real kind of city, but it's not a real place, right? Um, you know, the San Andreas and whatever they, they call it um, um, is a fictional city that's built to feel like a city, but it's also built to be fun. And and you got to know where to cross that line carefully. And that's, that's one of the hardest jobs as a game designer is that you just keep constantly asking yourself and challenging yourself and other people are going to keep challenging you like, man, that's just not like, you know, it needs to look good, but you know, you don't want it to be too perfect and too simulation. Um, and you got to keep finding that line, walking that razor's edge. And we, we will find ourselves kind of changing stuff a lot. Sometimes like we don't want to make it too easy. Don't want to make it too hard. Don't want to make it too gamey or too realistic. Right. It's like, where is that perfect point in the middle that my game needs that I want to do. And there's not again, a right or wrong answer, but you got to understand like what, you know, is going to make this, you know, game fun. Right. Um, let's see. Thanks again, guys, for all the comments. This is great. I, I love having conversations with, with people and not just talking at you. So I do appreciate all the, all the talking, especially, um, Daniel and the fallen one. Um, same thing, like followers saying, you know, um, um, 
like a house, like take even just a single house, right? Like you may not necessarily need to have permission. You might make a house feel, you know, look at a movie like The Shining or something, right? Like, I mean, that is a real place that they filmed at, but it's Hollywood and they, and they, they, you know, they make things like not every hallway is perfect. Not everything is there. Not everything, you know, there's not necessarily the exact same sizes of rooms, numbers of rooms, whatever. So you, you feel like it's a real location. And even when they're filming, they'll do that, but they still will have areas where, you know, it feels bigger, it feels smaller, you know, and, and they'll, they'll play with scope and scale and size and, and all these things to make it more interesting. Right. Um, and, and so think of it more akin to like making Disneyland, right? You, you want to look at Main Street USA on Disneyland or whatever, right? It feels like this real place. It feels like this fun place. But, you know, if you guys don't know, there's articles out there. And it's, it's, as a side note, it's, it's very fascinating to, to, to see how Disneyland was designed. Because there's a lot of stuff where if you're standing in the beginning of Main Street USA and you look down, they utilize a lot of like forced perspective and other things. So if you look, a lot of the windows and various things are not actually real world size. They actually are designed so when you're at one point that it feels much bigger, it feels much longer, the buildings feel taller. Um, and they'll use artistic techniques like forced perspective to make it feel um, like it's a very different place than it really is in a, in a smaller place. So that, that magic that Disney creates is something that we do all the time. You know, and, and knowing like what's there, right? It's that like, don't look behind the curtain, right? This is a facade and this is something that's made to look really cool. But you know, again, you don't necessarily need to make it look real. And so the same thing, even if you're not trying to design a whole city and you're just trying to design a house, like you, you wouldn't necessarily want to take a blueprint from my real house and try to replicate that perfectly. It might work for you, but be careful, right? That 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 may not be fun. Like, do you do you really want to have you know those doors in those positions? And, and think about if I'm making a first person shooter and I'm coming in through a doorway, you know, and somebody else is, is using this, you know, and they're coming at me from this direction. And I'm coming and I'm coming in through a choke point, which is in a door, you know, and they've got perfect cover here every time. I'm just dead. Right, I, I I can't come in if I've only got one entry into this thing, and they they've got cover, and you know, and you could build it as realistic as you want, but then ultimately in the end, you know, that's not going to make it fun because the players never going to survive it. Then you know, what's the point, right? So you want things often to feel inspired by you know this research. You want to feel authentic. You want to feel inspired by, but don't get so caught up in it that you're that you're you know um, that you're losing the fun, right? If that makes sense. Um, so let's see, Daniel, so a personal fear of mine is investing time in the game design and finding it to be a hard industry to get hired in. Um, you're a hard, hard worker and uh, work well with others, but I'm worried the industry has, um, buried entry, like experience requirements, um, mid twenties, you know, and, um, yeah, it, it is definitely a, um, it's definitely a challenge. So the, the, the industry can be a little unstable. It can be, you know, a little chaotic. Um, it's definitely a, a challenge. I've survived for 30 years, but you know, some people it, it's a little brutal. I think the industry is stabilizing. Um, again, you can get in, um, without any previously shipped games. If you have got a great portfolio and you can really show them that, you know, how to make this thing fun. Um, and that's really what it's about. Um, but it's going to be as stable as, is you make it. And sometimes it's just kind of dumb luck of like, can you, I know people that have been in the same company for 10, 20 years. And I know people that, you know, that last a year, it, every company, just because, you know, projects get canceled or whatever. And so I can't promise you this industry is stable. I can't say it's a 40 hour a week job all the time. You know, the industry does have a lot of crunch and does have a lot of, of downsides potentially, but you know, it's fun as hell. You're going to enjoy it. You're probably going to be happy and you have to decide what is it worth, right? And what, what is the risk worth to you? And do you want to continue to be a hobbyist for a while? Maybe do something on the side, you know, and go in. So, I, you know, again, I can't fully answer your questions as far as like, is this the right choice for you, right? In the end, you got to decide, do I want a career? Meaning something I'm just passionate about, something I love, something I, you know, that I just jump out of bed every day because I just want to go to work because I enjoy it so much. 
or do you want a job, you know, and you're going to go off and do welding or go off and do whatever else you, you think you can do to make some money so that you can survive and, and, and feed your family. And it, it, it's a, it's a tricky balance. I, I started making games when I was 20. Um, and, um, very shortly thereafter had my first kid and it was a challenge. You know, I had two, two boys working in the game industry, you know, and the long hours and the instability and all that definitely was a problem. Um, but in the same hand, you know, we got through it and we loved it and we understood and, you know, and so it's really just whether you want to risk that or not. Um, so yeah, no worries, Daniel. <laughs> But I, uh, I wish I could give you a better answer. It, the, again, it's it's going to come down to that risk assessment that you need to do to decide. You know, do you want to you want to you know have fun and and really enjoy the career, or you know find something that's a little bit more nine to five and a little bit more stable. Um, that's that's for sure. Um, you know, if you do if you do if you do go into something like programming. Um, or depending on if you're technical or whatever, um, game programmers or just programmers in general are a little bit more stable. Um, there's a lot more opportunity um, out there, I think. You know, but again, you know, game design right now is doing pretty well. There's game design. There's a lot of jobs out there. There's lots of opportunities out there. But if you wanted something, if you if you have technical aptitude um, and you think you could be programming or something, then maybe looking to be a game programmer, which ultimately could allow you then to become just a mobile apps programmer or website programmer or, you know, there's there's a billion programming jobs out there. There's always a shortage of programmers. Um, and so you probably will find more stability there, but you may not necessarily, the job may not be as fun, um, but, you know, you probably will make more money and probably, you know, have a different level of, of stability as a programmer if that's something you're, you're interested in and, and capable of. So, so you might look into that a little bit. And CG Spectrum also has a, a game, um, a game programming um, class, but there's lots of programming stuff out there, and then you could always do game design on the side, and ultimately became become a gameplay systems programmer, and combine the two your two passions together at some point as well. Yeah, so the following one I would definitely suggest change things as much as possible, and try to not rely on any anything that requires a a real world, you know, approval of stuff. So for example, they even give you, to show you guys how complicated it gets. I've worked on lots and lots and lots and lots of movie games, you know, dozens and dozens of, mo of games based on, you know, either movies that were coming out or pre-existing stuff like Star Wars. Now, and one of the challenges on games like that, or give an example of like, I worked on a bunch of James Bond games, right? And, and those were based usually on, um, most were based on movies that were coming out or were out. Uh, a few were just James Bond universe and we got to do what we wanted to do with James Bond. But James Bond obviously is one of the most recognizable characters with, you know, whatever 20 something movies and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like who doesn't know about James Bond, right? Well, when you go to a movie studio and you license James Bond and you license even a specific game with James Bond, um, one of the challenges is that like you get basically the name James Bond and and you get the rights to do something but beyond that like everything else that's even associated with the movie like we don't even have rights to so for example I did a game with Pierce Brosnan and we had to pay him an exorbitant amount of money like a lot 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 of money um just for what we call image and likeness just to put him in the game and just for him to to use his voice um, to do some vo voiceover dialogue um, for us um, was was a crazy amount of money. And so every single actor that was in that movie, we had to pay the rights, you know, to um, to also use them. We had to pay the rights for all the music in the game because the, the people, the musicians, gave the rights to the movie only. And so now we also had to pay them more money to, to be able to use the music in the game. If there was a location that was specific that we needed to have, um, like they had a gunfight, you know, just making stuff like at Starbucks or something, we would have to go pay Starbucks and we would have to go do, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's other stuff like the car industry, for example. Um, there's a lot of backlash in licensing cars. Um, they don't want uh, Ford and a lot of companies don't want their cars to be damaged in a game. And so if you're going to have a game that has guns and, and you, if you have the ability to drive a car and you have the ability to crash the car or blow the car up 
or things like that. Um, most of the car companies won't license you their car because they don't want it to actually ever be seen as damaged. Um, and and so then you got to make that up, right? And and then you know there's just it, or guns is, is another one. Like it's you have to license all the guns if you want to put them in a game. And a lot of the, the and a lot of the, there's so much backlash against guns and stuff right now that even then a lot of the gun companies are not allowing you to. Um, um, a lot of the gun companies are not allowing you to license their guns right now. So you got to make that up. So sometimes it's just a lot easier just to make everything up and not have to like worry about licensing. But, you know, that's a whole talk in and of itself. But licensing is part of this research problem, right? And understanding like, what am I allowed to use? What am I allowed to do? Is that fun? And, you know, and, and what's needed? What's not needed? What, what's required? What's not required? You know, those kinds of things. And, um, and so that's why we do so much research, right? And so um, hopefully this, you know, this is um, answering some of you guys' questions on, on, the, on the research side. It's a big topic, and I'm kind of going through this um, as detailed as I can. But um, obviously this is gonna this is gonna be a, a few weeks, or at least a, another week. We've got 23 or so slides, and we're on number six right now, and an hour and a half in. So. I apologize if I'm rambling a little bit, but hopefully you guys are getting some great information out of this. Um, but we'll keep going and just already plan on next week continuing this talk. Um, um, Daniel, um, yeah, we've had some of our students have started working, but our our program um, is relatively new for game design. Um, and because it's a year long, we're just getting our first graduates. So we are um, we have had some people get hired by Blizzard, EA, you know, some big companies, some people have gone on um, to do some indie stuff um, and things. So we we have had some people have success. Um, those tend to be the people that put a lot more in and tend to um, also tend to be people that came in with some pre-existing knowledge, not in game design, but like uh, like with programming or other areas um, that's helped jumpstart um, um, their careers a little bit better. Um, if you come, what I find fresh out of high school or something, it's difficult because you don't have even a lot of the GEs. Like if you think about like the skills you need to do, to, to do a game design, to be a game designer, like, you know, we use a lot of math. We use a lot of science. We use a lot of art, you know, and, and just general computer technology, scripting, programming, you know, things like that. Um, I use psychology every single day. So I, I read a lot of books on psychology. I've taken a lot of classes on psychology. Like psychology, uh, there's a science behind what we often, when we just kind of make things up, it's uh, quite often we're, we're really using psychology, you know, in, in a lot of what we do. Um, so a lot of what, what a lot of universities call GE, you know, level type stuff, learning history, learning all these things, Almost all of it. There's very few times that I, that somebody could say like, "Oh, how does this GE class help me as a game designer?" I'm like, "Here, let me show you." You know, and and so there's a lot of just even the GE work that just goes as as building you as a better person, as a foundation, you know, and things like that. And obviously, maybe a class in chemistry or a class in whatever. Not everything is. 100% applicable, um, but I do believe in cross-lateral learning, and I do believe universities teach you how to like think, you know, and stuff like that. So at CG Spectrum, we're more trade school-ish, meaning we're crash coursing you in, we're going to get you in with the bare minimum set of knowledge, but, you know, if you don't have some of the other foundation stuff, if you're not great at math and not great at other things, you're going to struggle a little bit, and you're going to have to to take on a little bit more um, to do that, and so that's why I just you know encourage you like you know again everybody comes in from a different place and it doesn't mean you can't be a rock star that comes out of high school and 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 rocks it and you know and works really hard um learns the extra stuff and then gets a job with with you know only a year of college some kids are doing that I mean it is possible um but it's much harder right and so um, just you have to just kind of be realistic about what your skill set is and what you're capable of. So this is a tough topic, and for um, um, for those of you that haven't seen it again, I do have some previous talks about communi communicating in general. Um, this is a, um, a a massive part of what we do, um, and. You know, and it's hard to 
to know like how to express just like how important this is. So communication skills in general is a very, 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 very significant portion of what we do every day. We talk. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've literally gotten kicked out of a lot of the game teams. You know, you've got one big room, you know, and they, they call them these pits, right? And we'll, we'll have a, a single room with 50 people in it. Or and I, in some cases, I've had three or 400 people in one room um, and with no walls dividing. And then maybe some like offices along the outside or some conference rooms along the outside. Um, but even at companies like Disney, when I was there, we, even, you know, at my level, you know, so it didn't matter if you were a VP or you're the janitor, nobody had a, had their own office. Like literally everybody sat in a cubicle in there. And so even the top, top guys um, like myself still had a cubicle. And so if I wanted to have a meeting, I had to go like book a conference room and it was just, it was a pain because one, we had no privacy, you know, I couldn't have difficult conversations or talk about salaries or do other stuff, um, which was part of it. Excuse me. But the but one of the problems and one of the challenges in, in the communication is is or was that um, as game designers, we sometimes just talk all day long. Like, you know, that that's one of my secret superpowers for my friends that know me is I can literally, as you've seen in this live stream, and if you watch my others, I very rarely even have a, a, a pre-made script or whatever. I can ramble about game design all day long and I can talk game design all day long. And, um, but that's, it's not just that I like to do it. I mean, I have to do that in my job. I have to talk and I got to tell my team what to do. We got to talk about ideas and back and forth and back and forth. And we're brainstorming and we're doing these things and we're just, we're constantly communicating all day long, especially when people are working on different related systems and, and things. And, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've gotten kicked out of, out of the pits, you know, where like just literally like eventually so many people complain, like the entire design team would just get moved into another room by itself or something like that. Cause everybody's like, can you guys just shut up? Like we're all trying to work, you know, and the programmers like it nice and quiet and they just want to focus on their thing. And the game designers are just like bah, 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 all day long. And, you know, and that's what we do. We talk. You know, and we're, you know, and then as soon as two of us start talking about one thing, the problem with the big pits is then everybody's got an opinion, you know, and suddenly now the entire design team's in, in having the same conversation. And now suddenly the programmers are like, hey, I went in on that too. And then the artists, next thing you know, like the whole team's talking and like you, you lose productivity very quickly. <laughs> and so it, it is a challenge, but, but we do, I'm, I'm joking about us talking in sleep, but I'm not. I mean, we, we talk. A lot, and so if you are a shy, introverted person, you will not succeed as a game designer most of the time. I mean, there there's a few roles, there's a few companies that you can kind of hide a little bit, um, but really, you've got to be a social butterfly. You've got to be, you know, able to get up and pitch your ideas. You know, and and pitching isn't just going up to the CEO and saying like, "Hey, I got an idea for a game. Can we make this?" Pitching can literally be like turning to the guy next to you. You know, who could be a programmer, who's going to implement the feature to your boss, who's the lead designer to whatever. And, you know, and you might be like, dude, what do you think? I got this idea. Like, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then you do this. And like, what do you, what do you think? You like it? You know, can I do that? Yes. No. Like, and then they're like, no, you suck. You're stupid. Go home. And you're like, Whoa! and you cry and then, and you suck it up and you come up with another idea and then you pitch it at them again the next day. And so. Our lives are, are I, you know, I, I, I can it to being used car salesmen, you know, who are kind of like my most wor worst hated people in the whole world. Um, and um, I had to deal with them this morning. I got, I got a new Jeep and uh, they messed it up. You know, the sales guys messed it up. I literally had to fight with them this morning back at the dealership. And yeah, not my favorite thing. I almost lost it. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I hate that sliminess of, being, of those types of people. But, you know, at some levels we are too. I mean, we, we are the used car salesmen of the game industry and that we are constantly like, so what do you think? I got this idea. You know, do you want to do this and do that? And then Mario can jump and, you know, and, and, and everybody's looking at you like, no, we could never implement that in a million years. And you're like, but, 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 it, but it's a great idea. And everybody just shakes their head and then you, you go redo your idea, right? But we're constantly being kind of salesmen, if that makes sense, right? We're constantly trying to get the team to buy off on our ideas and understand them 
but it but it has to be conversations. It can't be dictation, right? You can't come in even even with my experience with with who I am. I don't come into my teams and go like do this, do this, do this, do this, you know, and go execute everybody now. Listen to me now. Go, you know, you know, you have till tomorrow. Like, you know, like it's not about that, right? This is about like, hey guys, I got an idea. What do you think about this? Like, do you think we can do this? You got any better ideas? Anybody else? Okay, sure, go do that. Like, and let me know if you have a problem or if you get a better idea, right? It's it's conversations. It's not, you know, it's not about me even with my experience, telling them what to do because there's always things I don't know. I don't understand the engine, the technology intimately like the programmers do and stuff, right? And so so that's why it has to be about having conversations with people, being a good teammate, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And, it, and, and then, you know, trying things and trying things and talking to them and, and being honest about like, is this really fun, you know? And if you don't ask those kinds of questions, you're never going to get, you know, responses. And then, and then learning how to be a great communicator is also about being a good listener, right? And, and learning how to take feedback and learning how to give feedback, right? And, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and whether that's verbally over text, over IM or whatever communication channel you guys are doing, um, you know, and learning how to pitch things to your team is a totally different skill set than learning how to get up in front of a bunch of executives, you know, and, um, and, you know, how do you give a, a really big presentation, you know, in front of, you know, all the executives at a big company. Right. And, and that can be a, um, 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 you know, it, it can be really scary, you know, especially when you're getting in front of the CEO and, and all these things. And, and, and sometimes we prep for, weeks and months on these things. I'll tell you guys a funny story since we're talking about it. Um, back when I was at EA, um, this would have been like 2003, I think. Um, I was working on this game. It ultimately came out as Mercenaries. And um, I had to go pitch um, this game. You know, And so we had worked for months to put together a prototype, put together all the GDD, the documents, uh, a, a pitch you know, that we worked on incessantly and videos, all this material to go into what we call this go, no go meeting, you know, which was going to happen on a Monday morning. You know, it was literally going to be me in front of all the, the C level executives, everybody, you know, there. And I was still kind of, I mean, kind of sort of new in the industry. I mean, I'd been in for 10 years, but I still like at EA, I was new to EA and like, I was pretty scared. Like this, this was, this was a huge scary meeting for me to get up in front of everybody to pitch my game for the first time. And, um, so to make it even worse, the night before, I literally just, I mean, I literally just started EA or I just moved there. And so I literally just bought a house and a Sunday night we were moving, um, like 8 p.m. probably Sunday night. I dislocated my right shoulder, um, really, really, really severely. Um, and, um, ended up spending about six hours in the ER. Um, finally got my shoulder back in place. I was on so many painkillers and so many drugs and just, and I had like a 9 a.m. meeting that I had to go pitch the EA this game and I was in a sling. I was, uh, I couldn't even drive. My wife had to drive me to, to, to EA. <laughs> and I still remember like walking in in front of the, all the executives and they could just tell like how much pain I was in. I still just felt like somebody had a knife in my shoulder. You know, it was, it was back in socket, but it was, it was not not good and I had to give like the scariest presentation of my life oh my god but I had to tell him the whole story of how I dislocated my shoulder and I actually dislocated it because I, I was petting a neighbor's cat which bit me and it scared me and I jerked my arm back and it popped my shoulder out of socket you know from the stupid cat and um and so I, I, I had a reputation for the rest of my career at EA everybody knew me and everybody but the, even the CEO was like you know, that took some guts getting up there. He's like, he could tell how messed up I was. And for me to still show up and give the talk I gave and, and pitch the way I pitched and whatever, like they never forgot that. And they were, they were like, and I passed and I, and I got the green light, you know, on the project, but, but they were like, man, that was pretty intense. Like, you know, you could barely move. You could barely talk. The painkillers, you're loopy and whatever, and still get up there and pitch. And that's what we do, right? That's our job. We're, we're, we're there. You know, we do that. For the team, you know, and and so um, that can do attitude. You got to take with you, right? You got to you got to have a little bit of fun with it. But on the same hand, it's it's just hard, you know. And 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 you know, sometimes like Daniel, to your point, like sometimes it's difficult. When I was at Ubisoft 
because it was, you know, we were living in Montreal, Canada, so it wasn't in the States. You know, it was my first time with my whole family living out of the States. Um, Rainbow was a pretty intense project. And, you know, we were with a French parent company, you know, so in Canada and, you know, the French company. So the, the holiday for Thanksgiving to them meant nothing. And so I still remember my first year at Ubisoft, Thanksgiving Day, which to me and my family is one of the most important holidays. We always had a big, huge get together. We always had all this stuff. I've never been without my family on Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving Day, I was in Paris presenting to the CEO, you know, of, of Ubisoft, you know, my game. And that's what you got to do sometimes, right? It's just, that's, that's what we do when we communicate, but it's not always on our terms. So it's, that can definitely be, can definitely be a challenge. Um, but keep in mind that a lot of what we're doing is, is changing things. And, and it's not always about coming up with new ideas. It's like, how do we take this thing and make it work and, and really make it work with the IP um, I mentioned in the, in the very beginning of this, I don't know if you guys remember, I, I, I played this last weekend with my boys, as, as you can see, you know, I'm a big board gamer and I picked up this game, um, Star Wars, the Outer Rim. And if you guys like board games, pick it up. I highly recommend it. It was, it was great. Um, but what I really, really having worked on Star Wars games in the past and knowing the, the challenge, it's a huge IP and it's a huge universe, um, but one of the things that I really appreciate about the game was it really came across like it was amazing how much that they took the spirit of like, I actually played Boba Fett in the game. I got to be Boba Fett, you know, when I played it. And he played like Boba Fett in the game. And my other son was playing as Han Solo. And Han Solo played like Han Solo. And this is a board game. This isn't even a digital game, you know. And my other son played as IG-88. And, and like he was doing bounty hunting and doing all this stuff. And, you know, and, and it was amazing that Every card, everything really reflected the IP and all these kinds of things. So, um, but it was like, how do they, how do you take this thing and you shape it, right? It's not there, but, but through that becomes a lot of communication, um, back and forth with your licensors quite often. You know, the people that own the Star Wars IP or whatever brand you're working on might have to approve things. So again, back to pitching, you know, you got to be like, Hey guys, I got a great idea. You know, yeah, we've licensed Star Wars from you, but I still got to get your approvals, you know, and I still got to go to you and say like, is this okay? Right. And so it's, it's about crafting and shaping that messaging and stuff that, that's, um, it's a huge part of our jobs and, it, and it's a really hard part of our jobs. So the, the, the 900 pound gorilla in the room is politics, you know, and, you know, and as I jokingly put on here, if I mentioned everyone, their mother, their grandmother, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, their kids who are two years old, they're all expert game designers, right? And that's what they, they all think, you know, because if you've played a game, if you've looked at a game, you must know how to make a game, right? And, and unfortunately, in our world as game designers, everybody thinks they're a game designer, you know, on the entire team. And it's really challenging at times because, you know, politically, you're like, well... Who's in charge, you know, and, and then at some companies like an EA, um, you might go in there and there'll be, you know, 10 people in a room and they'll give you 20 opinions and you're like, okay, so, and they, and they all conflict, right? You know, these guys are like, go left, go right, go center, go this way, go up, go fast, go slow, go. And you're like, okay guys, can you all get together and make a choice and then tell me what to do, please? And they're like, no, 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 you just do what, do what we all want, you know? And you're like, but if I piss off any one of you, I'm going to get fired and I can't make you all happy. So who's going to fire me the slowest, right? <laughs> or, or whatever it is, it, it, you know, and it, and it can be a challenge. Um, you know, and you, you have to really know how to navigate politics and, and stuff. This is part of communication. Um, but it, it really is one of the, the bigger challenges of the job because, you know, most people aren't going to tell an artist if their art looks good or bad. Uh, most people are not going to look at source code from an engineer and tell them how to do their source code. But everybody is going to look at your game design and have an opinion on, on what they want to see and what they want to do. And so you do need to be aware of that, right? And and understand that the, the, there's a lot of different ways that politics, you know, come in come into your game. So we're running out of time here. Um, 
We'll get through another slide or two, but um, for those of you guys that are still with me and haven't fallen asleep yet, um, if you've got any more questions, um, please, now's the time to, to speak up or join me next week. Um, same time, same place. But again, want to thank you, Daniel, and the Fallen One especially for answer, or asking lots of great questions. And I hope I did an okay job at answering answering it. And sorry if I don't, uh, can't always get into every rabbit hole just because I, I got to try to keep the topic going for the whole, for everybody that's watching or um, watching this later. So, and, um, and hopefully here, I guess we'll, we'll plan on next week. We'll get into really the more day to day right now. We're talking about a lot of theory about like kind of that, the, the stuff that we're, that we do, but we're, we're going to very quickly, um, 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 thanks Daniel. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, you know, get into the, the nitty gritty really of what we do every day. Right now we're talking about kind of a lot of theory stuff. So the, the, the second part of the slide deck was really like that, like, what do I do every day as a game designer? What do I do? You know, um, how do I work in unreal? What is that really, excuse me, really like, you know? And so, um, please, if this is beginning to interest you, interest you, sorry. Um, come back next week. I think it'll be a little bit more meaty and we'll, we'll have a little bit more, um, exact answers for you on like really, really what do you do during that job, right? And, and this is a lot of the conceptual stuff of what you do every minute of the day. But, I, um, next week we'll definitely get much more into the, what am I really doing? Like, how am I writing documents? How am I, you know, going through that whole process, uh, from start to finish? So, Again, we're only, you know, um, you know, not even halfway through um, this, the, the, the plan to deck. So, you know, there's definitely a lot more here to, to talk about. Um, but lastly, kind of is, is talking about, um, you know, problem solving. And, you know, really as game designers, our, our biggest challenge, you know, our biggest part of our job is, is understanding problems and, and, you know, and how to think how to come up with them and, you know, and how to, how to solve that problem to make it fun again. Right. You know, and it could be that like, okay, you know, it, it, we have a lot of things, what we call edge cases and edge case is something is a problem where on paper, something might look really good to start with, but then an edge case will come along and, and break it or maybe invalidate it or cause a problem where suddenly the person can do something you weren't really expecting and it might be a one in a million thing, but you're like, crap, I, I gotta, I can't let that happen, you know, that happen. And it, it could just break everything. And, and so you're constantly trying to figure out like how to make something work, you know, in the, rec the restrictions that you have and the time you have, the technology you have, and you're, and you're constantly trying to solve problems. Um, to give you an example, like in the game Ratchet Deadlock, um, if you guys are familiar with the Ratchet and Clank games, um, Ratchet and Clank had been a, you know, action adventure platforming game, um, you know, with, with very heavy gunplay shooting elements for many years on the PS2 with many iterations. Um, I was then given the task of working on Ratchet Deadlock, which was going to be a spinoff in the game series that was a first person shooter, um, in the Ratchet Clank. And it was also going to be the very first multiplayer PS2 game. Um, if you don't remember, um, the PlayStation 2 did not come with a integrated networking controller. Um, at the time, people are still like, ah, internet, that's a fad. It'll go away. It's all about single player. And that was still the mindset of Sony, um, and stuff back in the P beginning of PS2, um, and, and stuff. My Microsoft kind of changed that with the original Xbox, which was the main competitor. Um, we put a network controller built into the integrated Xbox because we saw the future in the internet. Um, Sony still wasn't on board with that and then, then they released a, a, a standalone extra controller or extra device to plug it in and they needed a game to go with that so you actually could have a multiplayer game. So we had to um, create a multiplayer, you know, Ratchet and Clank game that was real time. You know, and the, and the previous games, if you had played any of the previous Ratchet and Clank games, I believe we had 53 weapons. Um, each weapon was modifiable. And so because it was single player only, you could be going along, you're fighting, you could switch between a couple guns, but then you could basically anytime just pause the game, go into a, a full screen menu that had all these options for all your guns and an inventory control, and you could mod the guns, you could do all this kind of stuff 
um, and and have these super detailed, very pretty interfaces for all your stuff. And then you set up your weapons the way you want to, then unpause the game, go back and keep playing, and nobody cared, right? And that's a single player game. That's all that mattered. Um, the number one biggest headache in that game was when you're playing in real time. Um, how do you switch between 53 different guns? You know that you had in your inventory, and you know you can't pause the game. You can't be like, "Hey guys, hold on a sec. I need to manage my inventory. Um, can you guys hang out for a bit while I'm <laughs> managing my guns?" Right? Like, and so the whole paradigm of what Ratchet and Clank games meant, of what their weapon management meant, all those things had to all change. Right. And, and so that was a massive problem that I had to kind of figure out like, man, this, the, cause that weapon stuff that they'd established in that franchise was so integral to like what that, what really made that game. They had fun, cute, you know, weapons that did some crazy stuff and, you know, all sorts of different things. And, you know, they, they, they have some really amazing weapons in the Ratchet and Clank games. And so we didn't want to take those out, but we also knew that we like had to be able to like real time go through them and then our UI. Um, technology sucked. It was, uh, I don't know why, but back on the, like the PS2 era still like the UI technology was still very clunky. There was not good UI solutions. Um, we had our own proprietary engine. We had all these things that basically meant the UI was horrible. The interface controls on a console are hard and managing all that stuff in real time was like this crazy complicated problem that I had to solve. And I had to get in there like, okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How's this going to be fun? How am I going to manage my weapons? How am I going to do this? And so that's just one example, you know, uh, in a game that I could have thousands of those problems, right? Where I've got to just figure out like, man, how do I make that work? How do I do this? How do I do that? Like, how do I shoot a grappling hook and slide down this thing? How do I, you know, do whatever? How do I make ghosts appear? I don't know, whatever, whatever it is that the problems we're solving could be from technology. They could be from fun. They can be from, you know, all sorts of stuff. And, and sometimes even problems of like, Hey, I designed an entire game and we're building 20 levels and we're doing this and that. And then production comes back and goes like, guys, we're a little low on money. We're a little bit low on time. So yeah, I know you had 20 levels and you're building all 20 levels, but can you make the game 10 levels now instead? And you're like, uh, how do I take out 10 levels when I've got all the ramping of mechanics and stories and like all these kinds of things. And now I got to rejigger the entire game and basically redesign everything because I just cut half of it out. That happens to me all the time. Like I, I've never been on a project that's ever shipped, you know, the entirety of what was planned in the beginning. Um, it, the last thing, it's always solving these complicated problems. So that's what we do as game designers. We are constantly, and we can have the best plan at the start of a game, but you know, by the end of it, it's probably all going to change. You know, and it's probably all going to be there, and, and, it, and it's really tricky. And our job, really at its core, is solving problems. All right, well, out of time. Two hours flew by. Sorry for the rambling. Um, but hopefully, again, you guys found this was kind of interesting and kind of what we're doing. But again, next week, I think we'll get a little bit deeper into it. So thanks again, everybody, for, for hanging in there today. And for those of you watching, uh, thanks for this. And I hope to see you all back here next week. Same time, same place. And have a great week. And we will see you all soon, I hope. Take care now.